Today, our guest is Dr. Anjula Singh Bays. And uh, Dr. Bays is a director of the Fourth Dimension Consultancy, interim chair of the human rights organization Amnesty International, and a standing representative on social justice with the American Psychological Association. Dr. Bays specialist training is in trauma and her focus is on human rights and mental health with a feminist lens and her degrees up to the level of PhD are, are all in psychology and she maintains full membership of a, a range of relevant psychological professional associations. Now I connected uh, with Anjula through the Young Global Leader Network um, uh, where I was sharing some of my work on climate anxiety and uh, she expressed interest in that, and therefore we corresponded from then on. So, um, Anjula, thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Jim. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's, um, I've been really interested um, looking into your into your diverse career, and and it is very diverse, although with a number of ongoing threads. So, I thought before I any, ask anything more substantive about specifics. Could you just say something about, you know, what are those core threads for you? The, uh, what's the motivation for the work you do and, and how did you come to do it? So always a solid question. And, um, you know, somebody had recently somewhat similarly asked that question because they were talking about, you know, human rights, psychology, media, entertainment. And I was answering that question um, with the idea that they might be diverse, but the values and principles and how I'm going about the decision making, what undergrids is it, it's, you know, a consistent thread. And um, I think there's two parts. There's a conscious decision to do what you do, but then in maybe spiritual or energetic terms, I also think it's a calling. And I, I think actually, I mean, if I were to sum it up sort of accurately, it's um, in some ways destiny. So I'll give an example. Um, you know, a lot of us, I'm speaking to you from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And, you know, recently Malaysia was right up there with India in terms of COVID numbers. And it was really, really bad. And there was a lockdown and we've been in lockdown more or less for two years. So I had a lot of time to archive, um, you know, my past. And I realized I completely forgot that I had a newspaper column when I was 12 years old. And my jaw dropped because I was looking at these headings of what I was writing as a 12 year old. And I was talking about anti-racism. I was talking about procrastination. I was talking about the effects of divorce. And even when I was 12, I was talking about the effects of climate change. And so whether it was things like, you know, um, you know, high school can be a lot about popularity, for example, knowing what power or privilege I might have, even as a high schooler, and going to you know a rival high school and speaking about anti-bullying it's just it was something that i'm drawn to i'm indian and of course even though the caste system is illegal that does not mean you know sort of qualitatively that it's not in effect and so i come from a caste that is you know royalty and nobility and as a little child i could not understand why a domestic help could not sit on my bed or you know if if I walked across the path of a Brahmin, which is a priestly caste. They would get up and take a shower. It, I could not understand it. And as we know, and now I know, of course, as a psychologist, a lot of parents employ an authoritative parenting style. So if your child is curious and asks questions, it's no, it's what I said. That's the way it's always been done. And that never sat well with me. So basically everything I've done in my psychology practice or human rights is calling truth to power. Calling truth to power, and um, yeah, and and questioning then questioning some of the norms that are hierarchical, and uh, perhaps seeing more dignity in one person than another because of um, the cultural stories we have. I've, I'm just I'm I'm what you've mentioned about the wisdom from your childhood has reminded me that I was very into stories of uh, the wisdom of indigenous peoples as a kid. Uh, and I had lots of posters of their quotes and, and so on. And, and I, I was about a couple of years ago when I had this sense of almost like a, a huge apology that, that I had not lived from that wisdom for so long 
because I was so caught up with doing what's expected of me and becoming successful. And, um, and all of that was kind of nice, but impractical. And now there's, for me, there's much more of a reconnection with, with wisdoms that are not celebrated, that are somehow marginalized. So it's interesting to hear you honor the wisdom from your, from your childhood. Are you, are you finding that, has it always been there or is it flourishing more for you now? That's a good question. Um, you know, so, so recently when I took up the interim chair position of Amnesty, you know, that, that's, that's quite a mantle in terms of the work that needs to be done. And it's always interesting. I think, you know, any relationship that is around you, it can be a spouse, you know, a colleague, a friend, they serve as mirrors. And, you know, sometimes you're in a position when, when you're thinking of your leadership journey, you're like, I can't believe I'm here. You know, am I ready for it? But it was very interesting. Like my high school teacher, elementary school teachers, they're not surprised at all. They were clearly, clearly seeing something. Um, and I think in childhood, you know, actually to go back to the sort of indigenous wisdom and, and, and um, sort of spirituality, there's an understanding and there's been research and you know books about it that at least maybe from an eastern perspective if you believe in reincarnation that children actually you know around up to the age of one and one and a half two they remember their past lives and then you know what you're speaking to I, you know you're saying that i got caught up and that's conditioning right of society culture religion whatever and then that veil between this and maybe higher realms or different realms it vanishes so they can remember up to a point and then we get very sort of conditioned and we forget but i do believe it's everyone's journey at some point or another that you will reawaken it takes some people longer than others but you know we're all on this continuum so i would to answer your question um i i would say i'm astutely um aware now of what my mission is in life in this lifetime are you are you uh able and willing to put that mission into words for us or is it a more of a knowing <laughs> that's yeah. it's much more of a knowing but I'll try um it, it's just simply a you know tweet I tweet worthy I rather tweet character <laughs> I can say that I'm just simply here to soar through serving that's it you know my husband and I really believe um, in the giving pledge, you know, that sort of non-attachment, whatever we have. And we've strangely, I think that's probably why we come together. You know, we're not so busy looking at each other, but rather looking forward and what we need to do. Um, every single minute matters to me and not in a workaholic, you know, chaotic badge of honor. I'm so busy. No, I think it's important to know how to be a human being as opposed to a human doing. But for example, I, I'm just very conscious and probably is, you know, stems from my Buddhist practice that life is the most precious thing. Um, don't take any minute for granted. For example, if, you know, my husband goes to work, I will give him a big hug at the elevator. I treat every moment like it can be the last and not because to be macabre or anything. It's just that life is very transient. So, you know, I think one of the greatest ways they say in Buddhism to understand life is to understand death. So I, I constantly question that in a stoic manner. So what simply to answer your question is, is to soar through serving. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'm, I'm loving the metaphor you've just given us of a successful marriage, that sort of alignment of purpose, um, <laughs> rather than just looking at each other and, am I all right with you? Are we, are you? <laughs> it's just like, you know, how are we together in what we're, where we're going and what we're creating syn synergistically? Yeah. Definitely. Great. So um, I would like to hear more about, um, you've mentioned Buddhism and spirituality. Uh, you've also mentioned reincarnation. I'd love to get to that. But first, um, yeah, you, you, you have your interim chair of Amnesty International. And so what I'm interested in is, is how, how important are universal human rights today at a time of clearly increasing destabilization, anxiety, not just with the environment, but increasingly so, and certainly so to increase because of the environment. Because some people sometimes say, oh, this is kind of a, a modern Western framework, human rights. Or they say, we need to get 
a bit practical and pragmatic now and save what we can and prioritize and some of these ideas are just a bit naive today well what what what, what does universal value uh, human rights mean for you and why are they so important so that's a really deep question <laughs> um well first let me start with and acknowledge that yes you're quite correct in the perception like culturally it's, you know it's 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 not exactly universally accepted, whether it's definitions or what human rights means, um, feminism. So for example, when I was doing my doctoral dissertation, um, and even then, you know, I, I helped create uh, my university's sort of first, first human rights course. And obviously human rights typically is populated um, by lawyers. I mean, I can speak for Amnesty, right? It's founded by a lawyer. And I want to mm -hmm. challenge that notion that human rights is best understood by law and um you know uh political science i think it's very important to so so for example when i was doing my doctoral research in in sri lanka they're like why are you doing this human rights is such a western thing um i think saying that is right up there with the reticence of you know people in the global south uh, and the expectation that they have to carry their weight in, um, you know, sort of the climate crisis and reducing our emissions because they're like, we didn't cause these problems, you know? So there is that sort of power imbalance that I think affects how different countries are thinking about human rights and feminism. But to say straight up that, you know, it exists in one part of the world and not another, that, that's quite uh, inaccurate. Uh, every culture has examples and its own definition of, Feminism, And in fact, in Amnesty, we are getting ready in the next year uh, to collectively define what our feminist leadership will be. And it's very interesting hearing Latin American countries uh, and, you know, what they focus on in feminism versus, let's say, in Asia. But, um, you know, Amnesty, of course, we have offices around the world. It's spread out. But that is that sort of democratic um, consensus decision making. Now, to answer your question, and I'll be very candid, you know, uh, <laughs> apathy, um, distrust, you know, it's at an all time high. I especially see that, for example, in young people um, in my therapy practice. So, for example, they don't want to bother to study for their exams, A levels, O levels, whatever. And parents think it's a phase, they think they're just being, you know, unruly and they're being a teenager. But really, a lot of my clients are saying, why should I? You know, there's no world left. Look at what you've left for me. And I think the litmus test is, you know, when you think of the United Nations, I have respect for it. A lot of times people will say united nothing. But I think the litmus test is, would you, would the world be better off without it? And my answer is, no, it wouldn't. I think we're moving the needle at a very, very slow pace. But to answer again your question, um, is it, you know, the declaration of you know, <laughs> yeah, universal human rights, is it necessary? It is. Um, the field of human rights and psychology, that's in its infancy. Um, in 2009, the American Psychological Association, it created a vision statement that, you know, included a section about the organization serving as an effective champion of the application of psychology to promote human rights and health and well-being and, and dignity. And so if you think about it, psychology and human rights, of course, have had really separate and distant or distinct histories. Um, usually there's not been a clear connection between the two, but that's really changing in the past decade. And, you know, milestone documents proclaiming individual human rights can be traced back to the 13th century, right? With the Magna Carta, um, the modern understanding of the term also originated in World War II. And then, you know, when the UN um, adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there's, you know, 30 articles, right, that are describing the rights mm -hmm. of human beings. And even though that framework uh, is a general framework of human rights, the distinction and the other concepts such as civil rights, public interest and social justice, it has been working in the past, but it's coming to the forefront. And even though what constitutes human rights, it's, it's a complicated, it's a contested topic, but I would say as a psychologist, even with the ambiguity, our ethical obligation is to do no harm for all psychologists. And that's going to encompass, you know, the protection of a patient, research subject, and 
in my opinion, all psychologists should keep in right, uh, keep in mind rather, the dignity, the humanity, and, and the connectedness of all people doing our work. So. so there's a couple of things you said there that really uh, caught my ear. Um, one was about how you're really interested in, despite the importance of human rights being seen in a legalistic way and it being becoming international soft law and national law and all the good things from that. Um, actually, you want to you want to bring in more attention to um, the, he the the heart, perhaps, and and the soul uh, that connected to human rights and spirituality. So I was just wondering, um, to what extent is is uh, Gautama Siddhartha a human rights activist? But we'll probably come back to that because the other thing you said was, um, yeah, young people turning up in your practice saying, "Why should I?" dot 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 I guess so any sense of doing anything uh, because of what world have have you left me so also speaking to the adult generations in terms of our what we've done and what we're leaving them and I um it's it's something which uh yeah I was really surprised by so when my deep adaptation paper came out three years ago uh, the people who really got in touch the most were people who were practicing psychotherapists because this is what they were already experiencing uh, in their work and they were needing to meet their clients where they're at rather than just patholo pathologizing these anxieties. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's been, so for me, it's been a journey over the last three years of, 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 you know, I knew very little about psychology and psychotherapy and I've been studying it over the last three years. But so I'm, I'm wondering, how do you, how do you, when you're presented with someone saying, saying that, mm -hmm. how, how do you, a young person saying, why should I study? Why should I plan for the future? Why should I save? Why should I have any ambition? Why should I, why should I, why should I? How do you, and, and connecting it to environment, for example, how do you respond? Yeah, so the first thing I want to say is one way that I employ a feminist lens in my practice is that if you think about clinical psychology, that is its antecedents is in the global north, right? And, you know, a sort of Freudian, Viennese-based approach. And a one size does not fit all. And so actually my degree, my PhD is not in clinical psychology. And that's actually quite an important distinction. It's, mm -hmm. it's an international psychology, which just, you know, very briefly in a nutshell, acknowledges the <clears throat> intelligence and wisdom of each nation state. And you need to bring in that cultural perspective in order to be the most um, effective and, and to have efficacious results, you know, in and out of therapy. Traditionally, <clears throat> excuse me, clinical psychology has situated um, the locus of control in an individual. And how can that be? We're not, you know, we're not brought up in a vacuum. You know, there, there, there's so many variables at play, the classic nurture, nature, environment, so on and so forth, right? You can sort of psychologically speaking, be a loaded gun, but if you're in the right environment, that gun won't go off. You could be empty, but your environment, like, you know, without cartridges, right, to set off. But if your environment is so abusive, and now when I say environment, I'm not talking about the clinic, like, you know, childhood and just, the nuclear, you know, nuclear family. I'm talking about nation states and, you know, refugee and migration issues in the world at large. There is a lot to be said about the Hyung concept, uh, Hyungian, you know, collective consciousness. So you could be from a, you know, like a relatively healthy functional family and not a cartridge going off, but the environment around you will put cartridges in. And so part of my feminist lens is, I don't think past the point you can be clinical neutrality. Like what's just going on in this room? Well, what is happening mm -hmm. on a micro meso level? Um, so for example, if, if I have an African client, um, that is understandably very traumatized about the disproportionate effects on them of you know, climate crisis, COVID, the brutal murders of uh, Brianna and Mr. George Floyd. I think it's preposterous to say, well, let's just reframe that, right? Cognitive behavioral therapy. That, 
how can you tell somebody to reframe their thoughts when they have a knee on their neck? There's institutional and systemic issues. So the first thing I do with young people is acknowledge that what they're saying is very valid. And that in itself is powerful because usually the adults in their life are oblivious, really oblivious. To be perfectly frank, I mean, I didn't, as a therapist, I did not start out as a child advocate, um, but I have so many parents dropping off their young people, and let's say for purposes of young, maybe 20 and under, and going, Dr. Bass, fix them. And I find that a very interesting word in itself, fix. I mean, questionable choice of words. Um, I think it's more about an evolution. We're not necessarily broken, but you know, really Jim, after one session, it's usually like <laughs> the kid is fine and actually quite smart. You need to bring in the parents. And this goes to the sort of intergenerational dynamic that we need to have and a dynamic and sort of dialogue. And as psychologists, we're in the unique position of being invited into a person's vulnerability, right? Each time we meet them. So it's within this space that our role is often guiding people through ways to, you know, through their, how to manage their painful feelings in order to bring their lives back into equilibrium. Mm. Um, so, you know, typically treatment for overwhelming affective experiences, that's going to involve a combination of physiological behavior, cognitive approaches, but, you know, when it comes to climate relation, uh, climate related emotions are our task actually, to be perfectly honest, it's less clear because mm -hmm. people are anxious about what their future holds. You're grieving losses, not in your family. It's not about an uncle that died. It's losses within our biosphere. You're becoming yeah. homesick. Um, so, yeah, a lot. yeah. I've, that's really important to yeah to to look at. It's a more of a systems perspective. When it's fascinating, you you say it's through the feminist lens that you're looking at at the relationships that are around someone in terms of the family, but also in terms of society, because. Yeah, I read something um, maybe a month ago where I think there's an Australian politician uh, and I've seen a British politician say the same thing, where they're blaming environmental activists for scaring the kids and, and um, saying we're, get, we're, having a, we're having a mental health crisis with kids because of the climate activists and, and therefore we need to do something to try and shut them up. And <laughs> so, project, hold on, I, I, I know how many young people are just just absolutely finding their parents oblivious to it, um, not wanting to take it as seriously, not not just meeting the children where they're at with with their anxiety and with their reality. So yes, it's. Um, yeah, can I just say something to that? I would yeah. literally, I want to say what Greta said. Blah blah blah. You know, I mean. I'm from India in the Asian, usually uh, parenting, like I said, is very authoritative, but I truly mean this. Um, I think the millennials are right They're you know, when they're like, you do you, I do me, but they really know what they're doing to a large part, uh, you know, really hashtag their woke. And I think, you know, for example, when people think of having mentors, they're always like someone who's arrived and older. And, and I literally, ask younger people to be mentors because I want to learn. They're, they're very tuned in, uh, I think, in ways that um, previous generations haven't been. They're sort of non-conformist. And mm -hmm. you know, to be fair, mm -hmm. um, not to completely you know, dismiss what the leaders are saying, there's a lot to be said about how you message something psychologically. Mm -hmm. So last year, I had proposed for the like uh, American Psychological um, symposium theme across different, you know, there's obviously many types of psychology, right? Forensic, educational, but everybody got behind the climate theme I proposed. And messaging is very important not to induce a panic so that people, you know, the flight, freeze, mm -hmm. fight, fawn responses, you have to message in such a way that, you know, to a point where you're like, okay, I'm deeply concerned, but that you don't create inaction where people just give up. There's tons mm -hmm. of psychological research on that. I mean, and I'll tell you a lot of COVID, I mean, a lot of, you know, um, heads of state did not understand that. Like the heads of state that actually have psychologists on their teams um, as sort of, uh, what is the word? Uh, you know, giving them guidance, if you will. Mm -hmm. They messaged much better. So you did not see people running in deep terror to, you know, mm -hmm. buy stocks of toilet paper and, and, and group panic. 
Yes, yes. I still have. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a PhD in psychology on why toilet paper. But um, <laughs> I don't, I don't. And which Freud, cultures Freud, went Freud for toilet paper. Freud, hey? would love Freud would love that, you know, because he was fascinated by the genitals. I see. OK, right. So that will pass then, that PhD. So um, I, I want to go back to, um, oh, by the way, just to say to the, uh, our guests who've joined us on the, on the call today, uh, please do um, share any questions you have for uh, Dr. Anjula Singhbais in the uh, chat box, and then we'll, we'll come to you later. Um, so yeah, please do that now. Uh, and also indicate in your question whether uh, you're okay to ask it yourself and with your video would need you to have your video on. I, I want to just explore just because I I love it. I'm, I've been studying Buddhism for the past year. Every two months now I go on a meditation retreat for four days where I'm completely offline. I go to a Buddhist temple. And um, so, yeah, I'm really interested in the connection between spirituality in general or particular strands of it particular wisdom traditions and this notion notion of the universality of rights of freedoms you know what's the connection between rights and compassion you know a lot of people say oh it's more important to be focused on responsibilities rather than rights but i'm wondering have you ha, what's the connection for you for example from your own either spiritual philosophy or your actual practices and your motivation to uphold universal rights? Yeah, so firstly, I would say it's a very deep connect because from my um, paternal, my paternal uh, grandparents and in, in, in that lineage, we are di direct descendants of Siddhartha Gautama. So he was a Rajput royal before he discovered and, and became the founder of Buddhism. And it, you know, it, it's very interesting because he sees, okay, I'll, I'll say Einstein was right when he said that if there's any religion that's going to understand science is Buddhism. It's actually a deeply practical sort of lived philosophy. And so when Siddhartha Gautama, before he became the Buddha, you know, his father obviously wanted him to take the throne. Right. Um, you know, a modern day interpretation of that would be inherit your second, third generation business. So on, you know, you're a scion to this whatever corporate company. And, and the pressure is deep. Uh, I see that also a lot that the complications in, in my psychology practice. Um, so there was a lot of pressure for him to do that. And, you know. A wise sort of uh, sage who could see the future, if you will, told Siddhartha Gautama's father that he will rule, but he will not rule over people. He will rule over himself. You know, it's a, when, when you get into psychology and you're studying it, the, the, the biggest question they ask you is, why do you want to be a psychologist? Even with my human rights colleagues, it's, so, it's, it's much easier to save the world, if you will, than to work on yourself and save yourself. A lot of people who are doing this work like doctors, human rights activists, they're great with other people, but they're in a lot of denial um, with themselves. Now to answer the, the, the sort of uh, question that you're asking, like what does this have to do with one another? Well, it's, there's this understanding of dependent origination, right? This deep interconnectedness. So let's bring up Starbucks, for example, and, and let's meditate on that mindfully. If you look at the coffee in your hands, do you know how many people it took to get that to you in your hands? It's just unbelievable. You know, maybe it's a farmer in Ethiopia, right? Um, planting the beans or whatever. Someone's harvesting it. Someone's, you know, putting it in a truck and loading it to Addis Ababa. Someone's flying it. Then it's clearing customs. Then it's, you know, getting released out of Kuala Lumpur. Then it goes to the barista. Your every single thought, feeling, and behavior has an effect. Now we are in such a like Insta society, Instagram, Insta dry cleaning, Insta everything that we've kind of lost, you know, everything's linear. You did this to me, I'll do this to you. That's not actually how it works. We can't see certain things, right? It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We can't see 
the law of gravity per se. It doesn't matter what religion you practice or if you don't even. If you throw a book off the third floor, it's going to fall down. And so this cause and effect, that's universal. And you know, actually bringing it back to a second with climate change, that's one of the biggest problems because the effect is not seen. It's a delayed effect. That's why we keep doing things that are so detrimental because we don't see the immediate effect, right? What, what we're seeing right now in the world is because of what we did in the 70s. And so the uh, Siddhartha Gautama left his palace, no matter how much his father tried, you know, here, here's this pleasure palace, here are women. I mean, this was obviously before the time of smartphones, so he couldn't give that as a bribe, but whatever. And he left the palace and he saw sickness for the first time. He saw illness, he saw old age, he saw death. None of that is inescapable to anybody. Um, I think it was Julius Caesar, right, who said, you know, I'm going to go into the something, paraphrasing, I'm going to go into the dirt like, like everybody else. What do you take with you? Nothing. So these concepts of non-attachment, I mean, basically to sum it up, I honestly cannot be happy if you're not happy. Mm -hmm. So that's how I bring Buddhism into everything I do. Because... I can live in my ivory tower, I can study in academic ivory towers, but there's that real world. And if that's not sorted, it will eventually catch up with you, which is why I, I want to try as much as I can to serve. Yeah, thank you. I am, um, one of the insights um, was this idea of, well, not, not just the idea, but the experience to a degree, it, it's fleeting with me. <laughs> of this almost like the deepest unity of being. And therefore, all of us may seem so different, but we're not. And that also, I, I may not like something someone did. It might be extremely bad, but it's the invitation to see, but if I was born in, into their situation, then I would, live their life and have the same uh, behaviors and so on so it's an invitation to a level of forgiveness yeah. um, and non-judgment despite having this sense of compassion and, and 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 having strong values but again none of this sort of judgment and therefore for me that seems to be connected to this idea that well therefore everyone has every everyone has dignity and sovereignty and rights um, and shouldn't just be labelled as not deserving because they're different to me or they haven't behaved as I, I wish them to. Um, and and you that, know, to that, to that point that you were saying you were describing, it, it seems quite experiential. And of course, the best things in life are very hard to put in words. But I, I would just mm -hmm. say that's just a moment of true knowing that nobody can take away from you. And, you know, a lot of times when clients in, in therapy are like, you know, for example, how do I, whether it's ecological anxiety or, you know, otherwise, this is not divested of actually going out in the world and, and taking action, but first center yourself. And that involves going into silence where these insights come that no one can take away from you. So his holiness, the Dalai Lama, I, 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 I hosted him many years ago in, in a brilliant conversation about emotional vigilance in daily life. And he actually said that if young people had access to meditation and yoga before the year, like, you know, up until the year right. uh, of age eight, there would be no war. And I fully agree. Yeah. And thinking about that, I am, um, I've been looking at, um, as you know, I shared, shared my, my paper with you, the one that's out in the psychotherapy journal from New Zealand just recently. And so for that, I looked at terror management theory um, and theories of experiential avoidance. And so basically, the, there's, a, there's quite a lot of analysis to say that as we feel more vulnerable, we feel more threatened, we become more anxious, there's the possibility or even likelihood if we don't help each other to, for something else to happen, for us to become more xenophobic, more chauvinistic, more defensive. Um, and so, and of course, therefore, if everyone in the world is doing that, <laughs> then we're going to create a whole new set of problems. You know, there's going to be a fracturing of civil society and multilateralism and so on and so forth. So, I, yeah, in that, I think um, 
one of the modalities to try and not react in that way is to become aware of those emotions and to notice them and, and be able to allow them rather than to try and compulsively escape them by, you know, oh, I know who to blame. Oh, I know who to follow. Or, you know, all those very impulsive ways of dealing with that inner stress. So I, I was wondering if, if do you see, therefore, with what you've just said as well, well, what's your thoughts on that? But also, do you see that, yeah, we, we urgently need, and it's kind of a bit of a contradiction there for a lot of people who are on the spiritual path, we urgently need sort of a, a huge movement of promoting these mindfulness practices to help us avoid um, unnecessary conflict as people get more anxious because of the state of the world. No, absolutely. Um, unequivocally, yes, we do. But I, I have several things I like to say to that. So the first mm. is, because of the time and place that we live in right now, you know, we have access in a way because of the internet and social media to the whole world. And so things become magnified in a way um, that haven't. And I'm not at all speaking about mm -hmm. denial, like obviously the issues of fake news and misinformation. But what I'm trying to say is that there's a mechanism, right? Whether it's a logarithms or whatever, AI or TRPs, right? For, you know, what's going to sort of clickbait with, with these sort of sensationalist um, headlines. So for example, I am speaking in Malaysia and the, you know, we've, we very famously and tragically uh, had a Malaysian Airlines plane that mm. went down and no one can find it. It is actually aviation's greatest mystery. And I can't tell you how many people came into practice. I can literally chart an uptick that were anxious to fly. And my homework for them was to actually go to Kuala Lumpur International Airport and to sit for three hours and watch how many flights take off and land successfully. What are you focusing on? You know, <laughs> thousands of flights take off is actually safer than driving, um, but we don't, we don't focus on that. So there's a lot to be said about, you know, how you are thinking, of course, reframing, focusing. But here's what I wanna say, no matter how hard you try to escape yourself and all of your internal thoughts, feelings, experiences, you are stuck with you. So I think it's in your best interest to cultivate a willingness and ability to connect with yourself, um, You know, even with the parts that seem frightening or painful. And here's the thing that most people don't actually get. When you try to run away or you try to deny unpleasant thoughts or feelings, you're actually creating an internal battlefield. So you're essentially declaring an internal war upon the self. And there's no winners in that. And, you know, the pain that comes with certain thoughts or feelings or events in life, it can't be avoided. And this is what I tell clients. They're, you know, if, if someone dies, for example, and you're grieving that, that is ecologically appropriate. Um, so, so we get that. But there's, as it famously goes, there's a difference between pain and suffering. Pain is inevitable. Um, suffering is optional. So it's only when we react to life's kind of inevitable pain by contracting the mind and body, that's when we're creating our own suffering. We were actually creating suffering in a way that doesn't need to exist. And acceptance that you're speaking about is a complete um, opposite mm. of avoidance. Yeah, so thanks for pointing that out, that um, it's important to notice if we're adding a sting that's not necessary like a, a sense of urgency in, a, in what you were saying earlier as well about about avoiding panic but at the same time then not ignoring the emotion and the cause of the emotion and and staying present to it um and yeah and so so thank you for bringing that well adding to what i was saying there we're going to go to questions now um we have a question from uh, Andrew Morton, who works at the United Nations and uh, is very interested in how um, how we can start to talk about readying for greater societal disruption because of climate change. It's the kind of conversation that no no one really wants to have. Um, Andrew, over to you, your question for Dr. Singh Baez. Yes, hello both and thanks for having um, given me the space. Um, this is about your amnesty and uh, climate anxious. Uh, particularly because I know uh, that Amnesty has great, so to speak, psychological battleground experience. They're really seasoned about dealing with and meeting with and coping with people with massive trauma. So 
personally, I see some parallels between the victims of human rights abuses and traumas and the climate anxious in that I feel both victims have limited agency in actually fixing the fundamentals, just like mm -hmm. getting justice, uh, fixing the climate, um, intergenerational compensation. So their agency is limited to their own small practical actions, what they think, and what they say. Um, so in this context, um, given Amnesty's background, is there anything that from lessons learned about they could probably use or could translate across to the growing field of how to brief and uh, comfort the climate anxious? Thanks. So, so and, Andrew, thank you. So what I, just to say, what I'm getting from you there is that um, many people do say that um, uh, having pathways towards agency at any scale is one way of doing something about about the anxiety, uh, rather than rather than just being better at observing it. <laughs> so, so as, um, yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. And anything from Amnesty's in, or or you, I know, uh, and Julia, you obviously have been involved in social action more generally outside of Amnesty. So, anything from any of that? Thank you, Andrew, for that question. I mean, firstly, Amnesty is also, of course, always learning from our partners, and you know. Our, par our partners and you know other civil society organizations but what i would say is that you know the kind of the ethos probably in the boardroom and just generally throughout the organization and even my own work as a psychologist is that there's communities that are you know in grindingly desperate circumstances what you're talking about communities that aren't even thought about like those without running water or electricity or you know they're left out of the climate conversation and that means and I'm saying this from my perspective, but also what we're seeing at Amnesty, that means not just including them, but deliberately prioritizing them and ensuring their voices are heard on all levels. So I think we need what um, marine biologist Ayana Johnson calls a, a sort of feminist climate renaissance. So I think without this, you know, a, a just and very livable future becomes impossible. Because when you look at the research, I mean, I just did a research paper earlier this year on um, countries that are led by women and in their sort of uh, COVID-19 impact. Um, research shows that women's leadership and equal participation results in better outcomes for climate policy, reducing emissions, protecting land. And I think, you know, some of the main characteristics that are shared by women leaders, like, you know, let's say Christina Fogueres, um, first and foremost, and this is really important, they, they prioritize making change over being in charge. So I would say we really collectively, whether it's at the boardroom, on the ground, I mean, I'm surprised sometimes, I'm not just speaking about amnesty, just generally in the NGO, human rights sector, humanitarian, how much infighting there is. We need to get, it's like, we're here to serve. I mean, let's really get back to the basics. So we need to get over ego, competition, control. All of that is very patriarchal, supremacist, hierarchical stuff that gets in the way. And it burns a lot of energy and it keeps us from collaborating. And so, like I said earlier, um, Amnesty is looking at defining feminist leadership, and, and that'll be our playbook. Yeah, so you heard it here first. It's coming soon. <laughs> um, uh, however, our next question is also from another white bloke like me. Um, <laughs> but, so I invite other people on the call who are, who are not like me, Andrew and Stuart, who's coming next uh, to, to also pose your questions. Stuart, Stuart is a, a volunteer for the Deep Adaptation Forum. Stuart, over to you. What's your question? Hi, thanks. My question. It's a difficult one. So I come from a certain place, certain viewpoint um, with regards kind of the collapse awareness, um, the inevitability of it and the timescales of such. Um, and I've processed a lot of that and find it, I found the journey I've done the last two years has been very transformational um, so much so that I've picked up a book on Buddhism last week myself so I'm, I'm, start, so I'm enjoying that part of the conversation um, and I see it as a very beneficial thing to do um, it's been life changing for me in a positive way um, and I kind of feel that as a, as a civilization, um, we would do better for, for, for more people to go on that journey. What I struggle with is um, sharing my viewpoints 
in a way that might push people to do that, given the anxiety and stress that it can bring in certain people. So it's that responsibility that I'm struggling with at the moment and, and how much of my own viewpoint I should share. So you're worried about the emotional impact on other people of saying that you perceive the future as extremely challenging uh, and, up, and, and, and sharing how upsetting it's been to you and how difficult your journey has been. Is that also, just to check, also how you look after yourself in that experience of talking to other people too? Yes, yes, it is, yeah, yeah. Okay. Very right. succinctly put, thank you. Big, big, big question, and a really yeah, live one for the Deep Adaptation Forum people at the moment about reach outreach and how to outreach. Well, Stuart, I think that's a brilliant question that it's going to be on the prefrontal cortex or front of everyone's mind at some point or another, right? Um, and again, I don't think there is a one size fits all, but here's a couple of things I would say about that. You know, it's the very people. So for example, in therapy, when I have a parent who goes, am I being a good parent? It's those people that have the most hope that actually do the best, whether it's, you know, with their own self-care or, you know, spreading a message or teachings, if you will, to other people precisely because of the self-awareness of that question. Truly bad parents never ask that, right? They're always right. And there's no issue. So the fact that you are asking, wow, how do I get across my message? And you're sensitive to your own needs and other, I think that A, bodes very well. What I would say is that no day in the office, and office can be very abstract and temporal or whatever in this sense, is the same, especially in this line of work, what, what we're all grappling with, right? Deep adaptation, the climate crisis, all of that. Please pace yourself. Um, it's, look, on the one, okay, there's layers to this. On the one hand, it is absolutely urgent. We need, we need to sprint, like, like we've never have before. This is not a marathon. We need to get emissions down. But if you day in and day out are approaching it from a sprint, you are going to burn out and you will be of no use to anyone. So I need you to think of it as sprinting some days and some days passing the baton to others who will pick up that baton. And you need to like then for, you know, if it's, it's a timeout or, you know, take, take a break because that should form part of your A game rest, recuperation, and, and tuning out for just a little bit actually helps you serve the larger cause. Um, there's something else I wanted to say. I know it's, it's up. Ah, again, because of what we have at our fingertips, uh, you know, the internet, social media, it becomes very overwhelming. Oh my goodness, the scope of the problem, what do I do? You know, everybody has their contributions that are equally valid. They're just going to look different. And so I, I wouldn't get into this uh, you know, and we do this insidiously, this compare and despair phenomenon. <laughs> Not everybody's going to be giving a plenary at WEF or the UN, nor should they. I think a mother, like a stay-at-home stay father and mother, has as much importance, if not more, than a head of state addressing the UN and what they're inculcating in their child. So truly, I mean this when I say it, every moment is a teachable moment. Every person right in front of you, whether it's the post, you know, the person giving you the post or, you know, somebody to use Starbucks again, all of you now know I love coffee, standing in line, it's a teachable moment. Your sphere of influence is always there. And so in a way, have, of course, the urgency, which I think all of us do in this virtual room, but pace yourself. Because one thing I've seen in human rights activists is they oscillate on this pendulum of like this hero complex, savior, and then I'm indispensable, you're important, but there's, there's, there's a lot of people doing what we need to do. And if you're burnt out, you can't actually get more people to the cause. I hope Thank that you. someone answers your question. Thank you. And uh, before we conclude, I just want to go back to your comment on, on feminist leadership, because many people looking at the climate crisis uh, say we need to have a few new policies, we need to have some better technologies, we need to just to make more of an effort, maybe bring in some um, better carbon pricing and taxes and so on. Um, and so a lot of people engage with this without asking deeper questions about how on earth did humanity come to this point of undermi undermining 
the very living conditions of our civilization. So I was wondering if you're looking at feminist leadership, uh, yeah, is, does that mean you, and you did mention culture of patriarchy and supremacy and competition and all sorts. Do you think there's a teachable moment around, um, around that? So like we're in, we're in these multiple predicaments and crises and maybe there's a there's a there's an, a central problem, and it relates in some way to uh, gender. Any any comments on that before we we close? Well, I mean, when you think about feminist leadership, right? I mean, feminist climate leaders they they tend to have a deep commitment to justice and equality. And you know, when you're talking like boardroom experience, for example, research has shown this. It's not your technical knowledge; it's your people knowledge that's going to um, that's gonna you know, really ultimately determine whether you're successful or not. So having emotional intelligence is necessary too. And this is the biggest challenge that humanity has ever grappled with. And we're not gonna solve it, like I said, from our prefrontal cortex alone. Mm. We need to come at this as whole human beings. That means the grief, the uncertainty, the rage, the anxiety, but also the love. And not to make an overgeneralized statement, but that on average probably comes easier to women or men that have done the work and, you know, that consider themselves feminist. Um, but, you know, the environmental crisis is, is continuing to drain livelihoods. When you're talking about the biodiversity loss, pollution, everything that's driving our ecosystem, degradation, you know, all the threatening economic opportunities and the transmission, right, of the zoonotic diseases like COVID-19, all these are more likely to emerge from communities that um, are exposed. And, and, that, and, and we know that the, there are differentiated impacts, mm -hmm. right, of the climate crisis on women and men, and that is related to ingrained gender inequalities and discrimination. So I very much think that a gender lens is essential to um, understand the differences in environmental impact um, and among the different components of society. Having said that, life is not you know, we don't want that cognitive distortion of black and white. It is nuanced, it is gray. And to bring it back to a Buddhist parable, Jim, you know, the uh, two sages were walking in the forest and they saw a deer with an arrow stuck in it. And they got into this conversation of where did the arrow come from? Of what wood was it made? What was the speed? From what direction? And the Buddha came walking and just plucked the arrow out of the deer because we just need to alleviate suffering. So I, you know, like I said, patriarchy, all of that are the reasons we are in the situation we're on, but now we just need to take this arrow out. And that means maybe to some extent, less finger pointing and let's just come together. It is amazing how much when, when threatened or uncomfortable, we just focus on greater measurement. <laughs> I really need to know more about this. <laughs> And uh, me being an intellectual academic, I, I, I think I suffer from that. It's like, uh, <laughs> you know, why, why, why am I continuing to research rather than just living a certain, a different way? I know what I need to do. I just don't do it. Okay, thank you very much for your time today. And thank you also everyone for joining. And um, I look forward to seeing you again. We're, this this concludes our Q and A's for the, for, uh, for this year, for 2021, we'll be back in, in the new year with a new series of Q&As for Deep Adaptation. Thanks, Stuart, for your tech support as well. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone who's attended. It's such a pleasure. Take care of yourself. Great. And if you're watching this on YouTube, um, look in below and there'll be lots of links to some of the things we've talked about um, and so you can follow up. Thank you. Bye-bye.